Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's Finest Naturally, authentic pumpkin seeds and pumpkin seed oil from the Steiermark, available at organicuniverse.com. Listeners of The Organic View can receive $1 off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website to submit your information for our free monthly giveaways. For more information, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com forward slash contests. On today's show, the ever so lovely Victoria Moran, who is the author of 12 books, has been featured in numerous articles is a highly sought-after speaker, is the host of Main Street Vegan Podcast, and is the founder and director of Main Street Vegan Academy, which trains vegan lifestyle coaches and educators, is going to talk about her new book, The Good Karma Diet, Eat Gently, Feel Amazing, Age in Slow Motion. So I'd like to welcome to the show, Victoria Moran. Good afternoon, Victoria, and welcome to the show. Hey, June. Thank you. Victoria, I really love your work. You do what I think so many people would love to do, and that is to educate people. You really help people to connect with not only your work, but your lifestyle, which is one of compassion and kindness. Can you share with our listeners how you define veganism? I think of veganism as a great adventure of living without harming, and the result of that is that you get all sorts of wonderful perks for yourself. So the basic dictionary definition is it's negative. It's what we don't do. So if you go to Webster, they would say a vegan does not eat any meat, fish, eggs, dairy products. Well, okay, that's true. But the positive spin on that is that we do eat vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, whole grains, legumes. We feel amazing and we feel pretty happy. That's how I define it. Could you share a little bit about your own personal journey and how you got where you're at? Well, I started out as a fat kid in Kansas City. My dad was a diet doctor. My mother worked in in what they used to call in those days reducing salons. You've probably seen some old clips of women in the 50s stepping into those belts and rollers and, and being shaken about with the idea that great chunks of oneself would float off into the stratosphere. Didn't work that well for me. And in addition to, to having this weight issue that I was constantly trying to deal with, I loved animals. And I remember hearing the word vegetarian when I was five years old. I came home from first grade. And this lovely grandmother age woman who lived with us and took care of me because my parents both worked and it was before daycare, she said to me when I was telling her about the four food groups, she said, well, there are some people who never eat meat and they're called vegetarians. And I could take you out to Unity Village, which was a place on the outskirts of Kansas City and I could get you a burger made out of peanuts and you'd think you were eating beef and I remember at that early age thinking "Ooh, this is fascinating there's so much that I don't know and so as, as time progressed I knew I wanted to pursue this thing didn't know how to do it and when I was 17 I started reading books about yoga And there weren't that many of them at that time, but they all said, if you want to be serious about yoga, you really need to get this vegetarian thing down. And I moved to London right out of high school to go to school. I thought I was going to be in the fashion business, and that was the era of swinging London and going to school there seemed like the smartest thing to do. But what happened in London was I did not become this great fashion person, but I did become vegetarian. I did learn about a a kinder, simpler way of life. 
Now, vegan was harder for me because there's lots of animal products and all the junk food, and I was still a binge eater. So it took me several years. I had to work on the inside of myself to get over the binge eating problem. I had to treat myself just like any kind of addict and get recovery. And once that had happened, and I do highly recommend if anybody's struggling with that sort of thing, Overeaters Anonymous, it doesn't have anything to do with food. It's all about what's going on inside of you. And for me, once I had the power of choice in in food, I chose vegan because it just seemed to be the sweetest, kindest way to live, and it's proven that way for me. I love what you wrote about eating less food made in factories and more that grew in dirt. (laughs) That was such a powerful statement, and especially since I'm a master gardener, I constantly encourage people, even if you just grow your own herbs in your kitchen, try to connect with the food that you're growing. And without sounding too preachy, which I know a lot of people who who continue to eat meat and animal products, they kind of almost frown when you have this conversation with them. But the thing is, is that you really walk the talk and your way of educating people isn't one that's confrontational. You have such a marvelous way of communicating with people and helping them to understand the choices that they're making. Could you please take a moment now and explain what karma is? And if you could especially since we have listeners that have different religious beliefs. Could you provide the unabridged definition? (laughs) Sure. Well, first, thank you for for what you said. And, And I think the reason that it's easy for me to talk to real people is that I am a real person. You know, I come from Kansas City, Missouri, a town that has a stake named for it. I actually was living in Wheaton, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago, and some people call it the Evangelical Vatican because that was where Billy Graham went to school. I mean, we're talking middle America, and so that's why I'm the Main Street vegan. And I think it's very exciting that all these wonderful ideas about organic food and and about staying away from the GMOs and just living more responsibly is not just some kind of coastal phenomenon. This is happening all over, and that's really important. So when you talk about karma, the, the actual term did come from India. It came from those ancient, ancient Vedic traditions that go back at least 4,000 years, and heaven knows how far before that the oral tradition went back. And it's this very simple concept that what goes around comes around. What you put out into the world is going to come back to you. Now, in those Indian traditions, they believe in reincarnation. So there's a lot of time for the karmic stuff to pay itself back in in that worldview. But karma isn't just an Indian or a Hindu or a yogic philosophy. It's in every religion and moral philosophy that's ever happened on the earth. I mean, what you sow, that shall you also reap. Well, you know, we we know who was talking about that. And the idea is that everything we do, and I believe even everything we think, is an energy. And the quantum physicists are talking about that now. You put an energy out into the world, there's a boomerang effect. And what's so fun about looking at karma in terms of the foods that we eat is it's pretty obvious to anybody that when you eat healthy, fresh food, that food that really did grow up out of the ground, you start to feel so much lighter and you have so much more energy. You start to look better. You look at your reflection in the mirror and think, whoa, whoa, did I just go on vacation? It's like, well, no, I've just been drinking green juice and (laughs) lots of big salads. But then there's something more to it as well. When you're also eating kindly, when you're not causing suffering and death, you you get a, a karma on another level. So you just can't beat it. One of the stories that really hit home for me in your amazing book, The Good Karma Diet, was written by Brenda Davis. And it was about her interlude with a hunter. 
Could yeah. you share this with our listeners? Oh, sure. Well, one of the things I love about this book is that it's not just me. There are also in the book 17 stories. I just put a call out on Facebook and said, do you believe that, that becoming a, a healthy eating vegan, you know, it is possible to be a kind of junk food vegan. So I was saying, do you think that, that really eating a good karma diet where you're being kind to others and kind to your own body has given you good karma? And I was expecting people to write back with things like, I lost weight, my cholesterol went down, and of course all that happens, and I got those kinds of stories too. But the ones that are included in the book are these interesting, different kinds of karma that one might not expect. So Brenda Davis is a registered dietitian, and she was, in fact, a registered dietitian uh, 20 years ago when her husband's best friend, who is an avid hunter, stopped by to visit on the way um, to, to go on one of his hunting trips. Now, Brenda, like a lot of people who buy the, bought their meat at, at the grocery store, was not comfortable with the idea of hunting. And she said to him, why do you do that? Do you feel that killing those animals makes you feel like more of a man? And he said, and this is paraphrased, he said, you know, the animals that I kill at least had a life. And I don't think you can say that for the ones that you buy at the store. And she was so taken aback because she just never made that connection. And so she did become a vegetarian. It scared her to death because she thought maybe she would get kicked out of the dietetic association. She didn't know if she was the only vegetarian dietitian on earth. But then, of course, what she found out was there were many vegetarian and vegan dietitians. And uh, she has become one of those in a very prominent way. She's very involved in a diabetic study in the Marshall Islands, and she served on all kinds of big committees and spoken for thousands of people as a vegan dietitian. But it all started with a little bit of wisdom from a hunter. It's absolutely fascinating, especially since many people just don't want to know. And there's an old cliche, everybody wants to date the doctor, but nobody wants to date the butcher. <laughs> and I remember having a conversation with John Schlimm, who is also somebody that you mention in this book. He's a well-known vegan author, activist, what have you. He and I both grew up on a farm, and we both had to experience what it's like to eat your friends, basically. When you go from that type of a situation to one where your food is purchased in a supermarket and you don't have that interaction with the process of where that food is coming from in order to get it onto your dinner plate, that is something that a lot of people just don't want to think about. No, and what's interesting to me, I think the people who want the most to not think about it are the people with the softest hearts. They're the people who are just so close to this and that if they did allow themselves to see, this is why some of, of the groups like Mercy for Animals will go to various college campuses and they'll offer somebody a dollar to watch a four-minute video of, of what happens in a slaughterhouse and, and on modern factory farms. And it's always the big you know, football player jock who has the hardest time watching the, the four minutes because that really is in, in the history of animal foods. And, and certainly they're, they're legal and it's a free country and anybody who wants to eat them has that right. But it, it does make sense to, to see it and know exactly what you're supporting. And then if that's where you want to put your money, then that's your choice. Now, you do list a number of professional athletes who have been extremely successful. Could you just name a few for our listeners? Oh, gosh. Well, there are so, so many. Oh, yeah. I think that Car Carl Lewis probably was the classic. He was already an Olympian, but then when he became vegan, he said that he had the best seasons ever. So we've got Brendan Brazier, who's a professional uh, triathlete. Uh, Robert Cheek is a bodybuilder. Um, uh, Tori Washington is another bodybuilder. In fact, there's a whole bodybuilding team called the Plant Built Team that without any steroids and without any animal protein is just winning 
all kinds of uh, awards and and uh, really tearing up that uh, that field. And then you know, very famously, we've got Venus and, and Serena Williams, and 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 we know that one of the sisters had a, a autoimmune disease and decided to be not just vegan but raw vegan, and and her sister said that she would do it alongside her to be supportive. And at that time, anybody who follows tennis knows that their careers were starting to flag and they just weren't mm. winning the way they were winning. Then they did this dietary thing and came back and they have had greater success at, at a later age with their new diet than they even had before. So it's it's pretty astounding. Victoria, you mentioned that there are invisible animal foods that people might not even be aware of and it's interesting as you point also point out it's been quite an evolution as far as the options so could you take a moment and talk about some of these invisible animal foods that are found in foods that people would think are vegan but are actually not and also some of the more healthier choices that people can make as far as snack foods, what have you, because as you said, there are so many options. And even though they may be vegan, they may not necessarily be healthy. Exactly. When I went vegan back in 1983, everybody who did it got so healthy. I mean, everybody lost weight if they had some weight to lose. Everybody's blood levels were just so perfect and wonderful. And in those days, we used to say the great thing about being vegan is it protects you from baked goods. And now that's no longer true. And we have every kind of of, uh, snack food and convenience food that the omnivores have. And in a way, that's great. Because sometimes people will say, oh, I could never give up pizza. Well, fantastic. You don't have to give up pizza. You can use Daya cheese, which melts just like dairy cheese. You can even get frozen vegan pizzas at the health food store. There are, there are vegan donuts and marshmallows and cupcakes and ice cream and all that stuff. And one of the kind of dietary theories that I think works so well for people, Dr. Joel Furman talks about his nutritarian plan, which gives people 10% of calories to play with. And I always think of that as my airport 10%, because I eat really, really healthy. I eat a very colorful, high raw kind of vegan diet. I feel amazing. I love what I eat. I love how my body feels and, and how it operates. But lots of times when I'm traveling, I'm in places like airports where, you know, they're just not offering green smoothies. And so I stay vegan, but I'll be having food that isn't the kind of quality that I would maybe have at home. And so that that works for me. But when you talk about the hidden animal foods, I think sometimes we think if something is just healthy, that it's probably going to be vegan, say a bran muffin. Well, no, because that's going to have egg in it. And uh, some of the other things I think, you know, I make apple crisp and I don't put butter in it, but, you know, when you get it at a restaurant, it's going to be in there. I think it's a little bit like the hidden sugar and some of these other things that maybe we want to stay away from. And you go to put some ketchup on something and it's like, oh, my gosh, there's a lot of sugar in there. So anytime you buy anything in a package, you do want to read the label and see what's there that maybe you don't want to be eating. But the real key to seriously vibrant health, not just better health. And, you know, it's great to have better health. It's great to go from the really highly processed, chemicalized kinds of packaged foods to a better kind of packaged foods. But the food that is really going to give you life force energy and make you age extremely well is the food that doesn't have any label at all because it's the fresh foods, the fruits, the vegetables, the nuts and seeds, the whole grains, and the legumes, which are beans, which are cheap, which swell up and give you even more than you paid for per pound, which have all the amino acids, and all sorts of amazing compounds, these these phytochemicals, they come in beans, they come in vegetables, they come in fruits, they come in, in tea, 
these natural substances that prevent degenerative disease and they're really nature's anti-agers. So we want to focus on those and then have our 10% of whatever else we need to have at an airport. What's in your emergency, quote, good karma food kit? <laughs> well, you know, especially if I'm going to be away from home for a while, I, I try to bring some things that, that will tide me over. So we're talking an apple. Apples travel well. You can bring a banana, but everybody knows that a banana who spent a day in a gym bag is going to be one kind of sorry banana. <laughs> but mm -hmm. any kind of fresh fruit that, that uh, keeps well. Raw nuts are great. You know, you don't want to have your nuts in the glove compartment during the summer because they do have a lot of oils that can go rancid. But just to, to have in a bag, uh, in a pinch, some high cacao content, dark chocolate, really yummy. And, and one of the things that's kind of hard sometimes for somebody who wants to be vegan is you go out to a regular restaurant and everybody else is having dessert and there's nothing there for you. You know, there might be some sorbet or, or some berries, but basically when you're with everybody else who's having cheesecake and chocolate sundaes, you know, it's kind of nice if you know that you've got a little really lovely dark chocolate in your bag so you could have a little something special too. And you just get used to the fact that the world is not yet set up for people who eat vegan or for people who eat really whole natural foods, but it's getting so much better. And lots of times I'll, I'll go somewhere and I'll have my nuts and I'll have my dark chocolate and I'll come home from that trip and that'll still be in the bag because there was plenty of these other places that I went. So it's very exciting to see that there's non-dairy milk and off the supermarkets. It used to be you had to order soy powder from some guy in Ohio, and, and he sent you this white powder in a clear plastic bag, and you just hoped it was soy and not talcum. Uh, but we all got by. But, you know, now it's, it's wonderful. There's so many options. And even the fresh foods. I, I know that it's harder for for coffee houses and places like that to have fresh fruit on the counter than to have some sort of, of packaged cookie or something that has a longer shelf life. But they're doing it because the demand is there. And that's the great thing about our, our system and, and the way that we operate in this country, that the supply and demand, whenever we say, no, we want almond milk and we want fresh fruit, then that's what they're going to put there. It's very interesting. I know when I first started carrying around different types of foods with me, one of the things that I made a point to take with me was my own tea because yes. I found that, and now, of course, you can find organic tea that's really good quality pretty much wherever you go, but I, I'm i kind of particular anyway, and I figured, well, if I can't get the soy milk or the almond milk, at least with the tea, I could have it with just plain hot water and I'm good to go this way. I can still be social without having to feel, you know, like, I, I don't know, for, for a while it was a little awkward to go to a meeting or something and explain to either the waitress or explain to the people that I was meeting with that I was making different decisions based upon my belief systems. It was just easier to say, well, I have allergies and I don't know. That was the choice that I made just because it was just easier to avoid all the explanations. But now I'm finding, just like with you, I do things, people do pay attention, and it's a lot easier to just do as I normally do, providing I have my little good karma food kit. And, <laughs> yes. you know, with my, I, I love that. I love that whole phrase. I think that's just awesome. And with me, yeah, I also do the same thing with the nuts. I also found that if I use a small Ziploc bag, I could put peanut butter in there. And then in another bag, I'll get, if I feel like having you know, peanut butter with, say, breadsticks, I'll, I'll do something like that instead of a peanut butter sandwich, which might get smushed or soggy, what have you. You know, it really just depends where I'm going. But I think the example of incorporating nuts or some sort of trail mix, depending upon where I'm going, I might have a grapefruit just because it takes so long to peel it. And usually by the time I'm done eating it, it satisfies my hunger. So And, and 
grapefruit is supposed to be very helpful for jet lag. So Oh, good to know. That's Thank very you. intuitive that you travel with grapefruit. Thank you. I need to speak to you more often. <laughs> The Good Karma Food Kit, I just think that's such a great concept to put out there to the readers as well as to our listeners today. So thank you for talking about that. You're welcome. Now, the next question that I have for you is there are a number of different approaches that readers can take to make the transition into a plant-based diet. And you go into quite a bit of detail about the different options. Could you just take a moment to discuss briefly some of the options that you cover? Sure. I think most people, when they're changing to any sort of of new way of of living, want to have it resemble what they're used to. And that's certainly human nature, and there's nothing wrong with that. I was with a young man. He was driving me on my last book tour in, in Chicago, and he was saying, I don't know why people have any trouble going vegan because I just eat what I always ate. I used to eat pizza and now I eat vegan pizza. I used to eat cheeseburgers and now I eat vegan cheeseburgers. And I used to eat chili cheese dogs and now I eat vegan chili cheese dogs. And I thought that's so sweet for an active, athletic 20-year-old. Of course you're going to eat that kind of food. That's easy and that's great for him. Now, for those of us who maybe are a little older, who maybe have had issues with weight or whatever, then we're going to want to eat a little bit cleaner, for lack of a better word. So what you do is start where you are. And for most people, they're thinking about, what do I put where the meat used to be? Because it's changing some now, and even in a lot of the conventional press, you'll read, make the meat more of a side dish. But most of us grew up where mom, what's for dinner? And she was supposed to say meatloaf or fish sticks or fried chicken. You know, that's what that's the question, what's for dinner, and you meant what what meat is for dinner. And so it makes sense that when somebody wants to change and have something besides that meat, that they want to know what goes in that spot. So that's why the recipes for the really hearty kinds of vegan entrees are very helpful. And you can make just about anything. There are stir fries and burgers and loaves and quiches. You can do a quiche with with tofu and some other things. You don't need the the butter and the cheese. You can do burritos. You can do all kinds of ethnic foods. So uh, Mexican food is very easy, Chinese, Indian, Italian. So if you can think in those terms in the very beginning, but what's going to happen in not too long a time, you're going to have that image of a plate and what needs to be on a plate change and it won't be so much what do I put where the meat used to be but you'll see that all these wonderful vegetables and beans and grains can become their own entree. Now what I've evolved into and what I think happens for a lot of people who really want to have high level health is that they start eating a lot more colorful foods. You know, in the old days, being vegetarian or being vegan meant you were eating a lot of brown food. And I remember this, where it was sort of like we're having onion soup and lentil loaf and wheat germ patties and brown rice. And that's all very basic, nourishing food, nothing wrong with it. But it's just so monochromatic, and it doesn't have all those wonderful bright colors where the disease-preventing phytochemicals live. So now what I tell people is you want your plate and your shopping cart to look like a Christmas tree, mostly green with splashes of other bright colors, because it's in those colors where all of these substances that are going to heal you and keep you younger longer are hiding. So I make salads so big that I get my salad bowls in a restaurant supply house. And then I make a whole meal salad. So people say, ooh, salad, ooh, you know, that's so boring. That doesn't fill you up. Well, it does the way I make one 
because mm-hmm. it's not just salad. You put your wonderful steamed yams or broccoli in there. You put beans in there, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, a wonderful nut-based uh, maybe ranch dressing or a cheesy tahini dressing. And you've got yourself a real meal in a salad bowl, especially this time of year. It hits the spot. Oh, I couldn't agree more. My salads are gigantic also, and to me, a salad isn't just something that I eat on the side. That's my main meal. Right. And there's no reason, especially during the warmer seasons, why people aren't incorporating more raw vegetables into their diet. And you actually talk about a two-week period that you took with your daughter where you go raw. And then you say, well, why should I make it two weeks to feel gorgeous and wonderful? This should be all the time. It's it's true. Now, I'm not a year-round raw fooder by any stretch of the imagination. I live in New York, which seems to be getting colder and the winters are longer than they were when I moved here 15 years ago. And so whenever that first cold breeze of the autumn blows, then I want my hot soup and my oatmeal, and that's all fine too. But even in the winter, I make sure that I get some fresh, raw, bright foods. Because in the winter, I'm not getting any sun. So where am I going to get my sunlight? Unless I get it from some of those foods that grew in the sun. So I have my fresh green juice all year long. I have some kind of salad. And even if, say, I'm doing beans and greens, and we have a wonderful recipe in the Good Karma Diet for Thai greens and beans. It's so wonderful. So that's a hot, hearty dish. But I'm going to have on the side something raw because that's really where the life force energy comes from. I agree with you. And I do the same thing. I try to incorporate as much raw as I can in the summertime, but in the winter it is cold. This is New York. And I know there are other parts of the world that experience the type of cold and even worse than what we, we get. I do enjoy hot foods. It's really a matter of choice. I have friends that are raw foodies. That's, Everything that they do is raw, and I applaud them. But I just think that you have to do what's best for you. Totally. But the options, the options are really what makes things very interesting and also keeps you enjoying the foods that you're eating. For sure. And I think that's why this juicing phenomenon has become so huge around the world. There's a whole juicing community of people who maybe haven't awakened to the vegan piece or even the organic piece, but they've got the idea that if they drink this freshly extracted juice with an emphasis on green juice, it's like getting a transfusion of youthfulness and vitality. And whatever else they're eating in the rest of their diet, they're getting huge benefit from just that one concentrated dose of, of pure plant energy. For people that still frown upon plant-based diets and think that this is some sort of a throwback hippie movement, could you please explain to them why it's dangerous to consume animal flesh at this particular point in our lives? Sure. Well, first, if I could just back up a little bit, that this is not something that started in the 1970s. This is something that some people believe started with Genesis. If you read the book of Genesis, Genesis 129, the original diet for humans was fruits and nuts. And then after the fall, God gave Adam and Eve the green plants. Those before were just for the animals. But after the fall, when sickness and death entered into the picture, we needed those green plants for all their nutritional and medicinal properties. And and they're also, I mean, Pythagoras preached being vegetarian, actually being vegan. He was himself a raw vegan. And he believed that you just didn't have the mental clarity for extreme study of mathematics and philosophy if you weren't eating a very clean, pure diet. And a lot of people don't know that Pythagoras was also an athletic coach. He coached the greatest athlete of the ancient world, the wrestler Milo of Croton. (laughs) 
won, I think it was six Olympiads, had a, a great military record on this raw kind of vegan diet. So it does go back a ways. It's not just something that somebody came up with it in San Francisco 40 years ago. But but to your question about what's what's dangerous, well, first let's take the holistic approach. Now, I am certainly not saying that somebody who eats a high but vegetable diet, lots of fresh organic foods, and also includes some animal food is going to be unhealthy. If you're just looking at health, unless somebody has a specific situation, like for example, coronary heart disease, where even a little bit of, of animal fat could be a problem, maybe somebody looking at cancer where that extra animal protein is going to push those cancer cells over the edge, then for them, not a good idea to have any animal foods. But somebody who wants to have animal foods and has them in a small amount with lots of plant foods, I'm not saying that they're unhealthy. And I know some of your listeners are in this camp and they're like, wait a minute, I eat some salmon and I eat some chicken and I'm doing fine. I I would agree with you. You probably are doing fine. But we're so connected as, as people and as a planet at this point in history and I think we're also evolving to the point where killing sentient beings it's just getting to the point where it's making millions and millions and millions of people uncomfortable it wasn't like that 50 years ago very few people were paying attention to that sort of thing so from a planetary point of view when we're looking at climate change incredible pollution, water shortages, the the flooding in one part of the country and fires in another part of the country. Animal agriculture is so devastating to the planet, so devastating to the environment on every level that to be truly holistically healthy, the more we can be having plant-based entrees using plant protein and and beans and grains and vegetables, the better off we are in that sense. Now, in terms of just human health, just my very own health, I have a section in, in the book that's called, Is Meat Really Bad for People or Do You Just Like Animals? Well, I like animals a lot, but we also know, and and this is is from um, Neil Barnard, N.D., that animal products raise the risk of weight problems, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, and certain cancers. They also cause inflammation, which, which is in virtually every degenerative disease as a causative factor. And when you look at any list of anti-inflammatory foods, it's like your shopping list for the produce market. It's berries, cherries, cabbage family vegetables, leafy greens, papaya, pineapple, sweet potato, nuts, seeds, all anti-inflammatory. And there's some other interesting things that we're just finding out. Um, Insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1, that's linked to to breast and prostate cancers and levels of IGF-1 are consistently higher in people who eat meat. Um, We find that methionine, an amino acid that's found mostly in animal products, High levels correlate with shorter lifespans. People who eat meat have higher levels of this. And so all this suggests a definite cause and effect factor. We look at great big wonderful health studies, the Adventist study too, the uh, Epic Oxford study, where they're looking at thousands and thousands of people. Now, obviously, you can prove anything from a study, but these ones that are looking at so many people the vegans outdo everybody else in terms of body mass index, in terms of, of longevity, of, of not succumbing to the diseases that kill the most people in the Western world. It just looks like a really good idea. Well, I would like to add to everything that you've said. And what I would like to say to those of you that are listening to this interview is take a look at exactly what is being fed to the animals that you're consuming. And as someone who grew up on a farm, I can tell you there's a vast difference between the way that life was when I was living on a farm and the way that commercial agriculture operates. And when you take a closer look at the food, the quality of that food, how many chemicals 
are being pumped into that food, not to mention the water quality and the living conditions of these animals that you're consuming. That is a very eye-opening. And the bottom line is, is that in many cases, these animals are not healthy when they're being slaughtered. So if you're consuming an unhealthy animal, that's having a direct impact on your own health. Not to mention the fact that with all the GMO crops that are grown and being fed to these animals, not to mention also the systemic, uh, the systemic pesticides that are the companion technology to the GMOs, you're talking about a chemical cocktail of all sorts of things that you're exposing your body to. And when you have something wrong with your health, that's unfortunately when most people start paying attention to these things. So, you know, folks, for those of you that have been listening and are still not too sure how you feel about any of this, do it yourself. Take a look at how these animals are raised. Get to know who your farmer is. But do more than that. Investigate the actual farm. Investigate the processes and so on and so forth. And that is the best thing that I can tell anyone who has a question as far as whether or not they should continue to consume animal flesh. And I think that so often people want to do the right thing and they'll go to the grocery store and they'll see a label that says something like free range or humane. But that's not regulated. Um, Certified organic is regulated. But things like humane... Anybody can slap that on on a food package, and it very often means nothing. And the other thing, about 2 to 3% of, of the food, the animal food grown in this country, the animals do have a better life than they would have in a, a confined animal feeding operation, which is where most of the food comes from. But that food is really expensive. And so... Just because some people can afford it, it's not an answer to to the problems. I was uh, interviewing a, a woman for my last book who has a, a, a farm where she raises pigs and does do it in the best way that one could raise very intelligent, sentient creatures who are going to be slaughtered in their youth. But she says, we can't afford our own pork tenderloin. So is that sustainable? I don't think so. I don't think so either, but the thing is is that when people think of the whole plant-based diet, they think, oh my goodness, you know, I have to go out and buy this and buy that, and there's so many products on the market, and the thing is is that it's not that hard to cook. There are so many cookbooks and baking books out there that offer very basic instructions on how to make all sorts of different foods that are plant-based. I'm sure that your food bill is not very big. I know mine isn't. And that's the well, one big thing that I just want to stress. Yeah, well, mine is bigger than you because you have a garden. Somebody told me recently, he who grows a garden grows money. <laughs> And I'm in an apartment in New York City, so I, I don't have that benefit. But I think sometimes people think, ooh, vegan food, and it seems so weird. But sometimes to just kind of listen to a list, like, for example, spaghetti marinara, <laughs> you know, that's vegan. Um, a, a, a veggie burger, a lovely salad with some hummus. Chinese, wonderful um, broccoli with some garlic sauce on the side. These are all vegan meals, and they're not strange. They're just yummy. For breakfast, I usually eat steel-cut oats, and I'll take an apple with cinnamon or some sort of fruit and nuts, and that's breakfast. Sometimes and I'll take a tofu scramble, and I'll make a plantain a yellow plantain just Ooh, because yum. I want something a little sweet. Or I might take a green plantain if I want something more starchy. I mean, there's so many different things. And as you point out in the Good Karma Diet, you don't have to conform to what society tells you to eat. You could eat whatever you feel like eating. Right. And you the could have thing a is, savory breakfast. I think we have this idea that, that breakfast is either bacon and eggs or some kind of pastry or, or maybe a, a yogurt or something, you know, sweet. But in Japan, they have 
miso soup and seaweed salad and edamame for breakfast. So who's to say you couldn't do whatever you felt like? Exactly. Victoria, I just want to say thank you so much for not only writing this book, but just for everything that you do. You truly are inspiring so many people and helping them to understand exactly what they're doing in this existence and what they're contributing to the world or not contributing. So thank you once again. Could you take a moment and share with our listeners how people can connect with you? Sure. Thank you so much. The website is MainStreetVegan.net. Somebody's got the .com, so I'm MainStreetVegan.net, just like Main Street USA. And there's all the information there about all the stuff that we're doing over at Main Street Vegan. We've got the blog and the podcast and then Main Street Vegan Academy, which is a very exciting five-and-a-half-day program in New York City that trains vegan lifestyle coaches and educators. And there's also a list there at MainStreetVegan.net of of, uh, graduates who are certified vegan lifestyle coaches. If you want a little bit of coaching to help you make this transition and thrive uh, with your plant-based diet, that's what they're there for. Thank you. And folks, please pick up a copy of The Good Karma Diet, Eat Gently, Feel Amazing, Age in Slow Motion, wherever your favorite bookstore is, or purchase it online. And also visit Victoria's website and listen to her radio show. She's got such a wonderful program. I had the opportunity a couple months ago to be on her show, and she is just such an amazing person to listen to and to learn from so by all means there's so much information out there there's so many opportunities for you to live a very healthy and compassionate lifestyle also folks please check out the companion article that will accompany this interview at theorganicview.com thank you for tuning in this has been june Stoyer with the organic view radio show have a great afternoon everyone